Okay, so this will be the, the last VASP, uh, well, let's say the last VASP feature related talk. Um, I think afterwards we'll do something about uh, a short little presentation or a summary about uh, parallelization strategies in, in, in the program, um, which will help you to decide how to, um, how to efficiently uh, use the, the hardware here at NERSC. I think you will present something as well, right, Senji, in this respect? After the, after the, uh, as the second talk, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, okay, cool. So um, I hope I'll stay in time. So 10.30 you said, right? Okay, <laughs> good. So um, we'll <coughs> today we'll discuss um, uh, one of the more advanced features of the code, uh, a beyond DFT technique. Um, which in, in general we call the random phase approximation. We, we heard about it yesterday. Uh, this was one of these approximations in the description of dielectric properties. And when we discuss dielectric <coughs> properties, um, I already mentioned that these dielectric, uh, the microscopic dielectric properties are input to uh, some methods that go beyond density functional theory in the description of electronic correlation. Uh, and those two methods are GW and, and ACFDT. So GW for electronic structure and ACFDT for total energies uh, within the random phase approximation to the dielectric screening. So um, yes, past is DFT the past? Well, DFT is still very much the workhorse of, of many uh, projects uh, in, in the present as well. Um, so it has definitely have the most experience with DFT. Um, at, at the moment, I think that many people use hybrid functionals on a more, more or less a day-to-day -day, uh, basis as well. Um, and I think the immediate future, so the very near future, we'll see uh, something very similar for the description of electronic properties in the random phase approximation as well. So there's, there's um, well, there's many codes now that can, can, do, uh, can do total energies and electronic structure in the random phase approximation. And efficient um, <coughs> algorithms are emerging and computers are getting more stronger uh, all the time. So I think that, that what is true for hybrid functionals now will be sort of true for the random phase approximation tomorrow. Which is a good thing um, because there is a need to go beyond uh, density functional theory and hybrid functional theory. We already saw um, many of these things yesterday, or at least on the slides uh, of yesterday. So in terms of total energy differences, uh, atomization, information, energies, reaction barriers, and things like this, we're definitely still not there. Uh, so we can't make predictions <coughs> uh, with sufficient accuracy uh, from these levels of theory. Um, for for band structure, and, and well, here we, we always look at, at band gaps, but, but band structure is more than this, of course, but looking at band gaps, we see that hybrid functional theory does, does really well for a host of materials, um, small to medium gap size materials, but as you go to, uh, to uh, larger gap size materials, there's still large uh, deviations with respect to experiment, and there's, there's always difficult cases where even for the, for the smaller gap size systems, hybrid functional theory is, uh, is definitely insufficient. Um, and van der Waals interactions, which is uh, a, a definite thing that, that is becoming more and more important as people turn to, uh, to uh, mo molecules and molecular systems. Um, yes. So this is, uh, this is, for instance, one of those, uh, one of those cases. I just put it there as as a, as a sort of a case study where we see uh, the effect of, um, where, well, I'll show the effect of, uh, of uh, including van der Waals interactions. So this is an, a reaction inside of a zeolite cage. So this is one of those things that people study in oil industry. Uh, this is one of the things that is important for cracking. And, uh, and we see here there's a very complicated reaction path that has been studied by a colleague of mine. And, uh, so the difference between the drawn line, so there's all kinds of barriers in there, and the difference between the drawn line and the dashed line is that in, for the dashed line, there were attempts made to include van der Waals interactions uh, in these calculations. So there are 
definitely uh, have a large effect and they're, they're mostly not captured by, by density functional theory and, uh, and hybrid functional theory at the moment. So having said that, there's still a very active development of density functional theory, um, which is good and there's promising functionals uh, emerging. These are definitely not the newest ones, so there's newer, very promising uh, density functionals around. With this respect, I, I really like to mention uh, this, the scan functional um, that has been implemented in the code as well and will be definitely in the, in the next update. And the scan functional is one of the density functionals. Uh, it's, it's a meta GGA, one of the density functionals that is able um, to capture par partly capture <coughs> van, van der Waals interaction. So and a meta GGA is a functional. So what, what we saw how we saw functionals that depend locally on the density or a derivative of the density, but a meta GGA uh, depends on the second derivative of the density as well. Okay, so I, I won't go too much into these uh, slides. You can can have a look at your leisure at the publications that are quoted there. There's a thing such as van der Waals density functional uh, theory. So non-local density functionals are non-local in the sense that they have a kernel that depends on R and R prime and it allows for interactions between uh, densities at a point R with densities at a point R, R prime. Um, so in that sense, but so, and this, the introduction of these, these van der Waals density functionals spawned a whole host of, of uh, new functionals. And, uh, and some of them work quite well in some situations, but there's definitely uh, no um, universal van der Waals density functional at the moment. Okay, so this we saw yesterday. Uh, that is with respect to hybrid functional theory. I made the point that, um, that hybrid functions are definitely not general functionals uh, at the moment. Uh, if we combine a molecular system with a metallic surface, we see that in DFT we have problems describing these systems, which is the CO adsorption on D metal surfaces. Uh, we have problems describing these systems because DFT fails to correctly describe the CO electronic structure. And if we turn to hybrid functionals, we <coughs> do better for the molecule, but worse for the surface. And overall uh, agreement with experiment is not good. And why do I show this again? Because I will show uh, what kind of description we'll get in the random phase approximation. Uh, so I'll come back to this later. So uh, from the point of view from a one electron picture, in DFT we have these uh, cone sham equations that we solve, right? So we have a, a, a Hamiltonian that depends on a local potential. Huh? We saw this before. In hybrid functional theory, uh, we have very similar looking equations, the Rotan equations, with a local part, a uh, Hartree part external potential, and a non-local um, exchange potential, the Fock potential, um, that we solve. And now we go one level beyond. And it's still, the equations look very similar, but this object here, so we had a non-local potential here in hybrid functional theory. And now we see that this is not only non-local, but also energy dependent. And this object that we'll uh, look at um, in the random phase approximation, and this is the, these are the GW uh, quasi-particle equations. And this object that we introduce here is called the self-energy. And th so this is a, a level of complexity more, so not only non-local, but also energy dependent. And this energy is, of course, this quasi-particle energy that is partly a solution to our equation. So there's an additional level of self-consistency uh, involved here as well. So uh, we'll discuss this in terms of green functions uh, because we'll, the point that, that we'll make is that, that this self-energy uh, in the GW approximation is the product of a Green's function and a screened Coulomb interaction. Um, so let's have a look at what Green's functions actually are. So the Green's function, uh, by def definition, it's the inverse of the Hamiltonian. That is uh, written here. And um, the nice thing is that for, for our cone sham system, for our non-interacting Hamiltonian, uh, we can write the green Green's function in terms of quantities that we, uh, that we can access, right? So we have here our Green's function as a sum over uh, one electron orbitals that we get out of solving our cone sham equations and these uh, one-electron eigenenergies. 
So that's nice. Uh, we do know how to get uh, the Green's function of a, of a non-interacting system, of our cone sham system. Well, this is just uh, a description of, of how you would arrive at a Green's function for an interacting Hamiltonian, starting from the non-interacting one, but I won't uh, go uh, deeper into that uh, now. So what does the Green's function physically mean? So physically, the Green's function, uh, uh, and I've written it here explicitly in terms of time, uh, I'll, I'll, you will see uh, uh, in terms of uh, arguments of time and arguments of frequency will frequently change uh, within the formulas. That is simply a, a transformation from time domain to frequency domain, so basically plays the same role. So a Green's function, depending on r and r prime, and on t and t prime, describes the propagation of a particle. So say I have a particle, an electron in this case, for instance, at point r at time t. Uh, so what is the chance of finding this particle at point r prime uh, at time t prime? So and in terms of time, this depends only on the difference between these times. So that is, that is what the Green's function uh, physically uh, means. And it's often called, for that, for that reason, it's often called a propagator, eh, because it tells us how our particle, if it that is at some point at a certain time, how it propagates, what the chance is of finding it, eh, that it has propagated to another point uh, at another time. So, um, well, this is, this is a little shorthand for this. So 1 and 2 means R1 and, and, and T2 and R2 and T1. And if T2 is larger than than T1, uh, we call this a particle propagator and it describes an electron and we often write it in terms of diagrams and I will, I will sort of throw a few diagrams at you and ho hopefully make a case for the fact that they, that they do elucidate this, this uh, kind of theories and do not uh, necessarily only uh, ob obfuscate things. Um, so we have a, a point one and a point two, huh? R1, T1 and a propagation from one point to the other in space-time. So this particular function, we can write it like this, huh, where it depends on frequency. And here it is explicitly written in terms of uh, in, the, in the time domain. Right. So that's a particle propagator if T2 is larger than T1. For the reverse, so and that's the reverse direction, if time were to be along this axis for the reverse direction, uh, it describes the propagation of a hole from point R2, T2 to R1, T1. Right. So, and there's a there's a, a corresponding uh, function again in terms of of our of our uh, cone sham orbitals and cone sham eigenenergies uh, related to this. So these lines that you will see in these diagrams are propagators of particles of electrons and holes. So the self-energy, in terms of in perturbation theory, the self-energy is a function of these Green's functions. We can write it as a function of these Green's functions. So and what we see here, we can draw all, all these nice little diagrams, and I will sort of uh, uh, give, some, uh, give some indication of what they mean. A little, a little uh, thing like this, a little ball like this, is just the density at a certain point. And this little uh, wiggly line is a Coulomb interaction. So this is a particle traveling in my system, interacting with a density uh, through a Coulomb interaction. So this is a simple Hartree interaction. Written like this here, and this, and so this is called a, a, well, I don't, this is called the density bubble, I think. Um, uh, what you s see here is called, uh, in, in, in Feynman diagrams, in terms of Feynman diagrams, is called an open oyster diagram. And this diagram represents exchange interaction. Won't go, I'll, I'll show you how you can derive formulas even from these from this particles, for these, uh, from these diagrams for these elementary interactions, but I won't do that too much. I just want to go to, uh, to these classes of diagrams because they are very important because they uh, constitute the random phase approximation. And they, say, they tell me I have a particle here that um, interacts with its environment uh, through uh, the Coulomb interaction. And what happens here, it creates an electron and a hole that travel to our system. 
And this kind of thing is, is we call a polarization bubble. So what does it do? It travels through the medium, it interacts with its surroundings and polarizes the medium. That is actually this little wiggle and such a polarization bubble. So it polarizes the medium, it, so it induces a change in the, in the density and that works back on our particle through the Coulomb interaction. But we could envision higher order processes in, in, um, in perturbation theory. So we have our electron as it travels happily through the medium, interacts with its surroundings, polarizes it. That polarization, that change in the density, works on the surroundings uh, through the Coulomb interaction, induces a further change in the density uh, that then works back through the Coulomb interaction on our particle, and so on, and so on, and so on. So uh, that we can, can sort of add, we can add these polarization bubbles at infinitum here. So, and this whole class of interactions uh, in its together up to inf uh, summed up to infinity constitute the random phase approximation. So there's many, many, many other uh, possible interactions, right? Exchange will take into account, but there's higher order exchange processes possible as well. So you can uh, draw all kinds of complicated diagrams, but in the random phase approximation, the only interactions that we'll include in the, in the description of our particle as it interacts with its surroundings are those guys, those what we call polarization bubbles. And why do we do this? Um, so let's, let's first, okay, maybe this is a, a little side issue. I said to you that this is a density. Well, actually, uh, this shows you how to construct <coughs> out of such a diagram, how you can construct uh, a formula that is sort of human readable uh, out of it. So I don't, I don't want to go into the, this uh, too much. You can have a look at it if, it, if it's of interest uh, to you later. But this shows you that this, yes, this indeed is, an, is a... Is a Hart interaction with the density, and yes, indeed, such a diagram constitutes uh, an ex exchange interaction. Um, anyway, so why, why make this point um, of explaining these polarization bubbles in such detail? And that is because um, summing up the effects of all these interactions is easier than including the other interactions. So they're very important interactions. And we know of a, of, a, of, a, of a convenient way of how to do this, actually. Because including other ones uh, is, is computationally very, very demanding. Right? But this we can do um, uh, more conveniently uh, than including the other ones. So that's one of the, the things which makes the random phase approximation at the moment popular. Not only because it's, it's, I'll show you that it's a fairly good approximation for the physics in many cases, but it's also a tractable one, right? So we can do it. Yes? Yes? What is it showing? Is it uh, travel, electron traveling? Yes, yes. So this is, a, this is actually, yes, this is a, so um, I refrain from saying that this is the direction of time because in these diagrams I violated that that, uh, that um, definition uh, in the exchange-like ones. But, but for these ones, you could say, yeah, this is time. So I have a, a particle coming in, interacting with the medium, creating an electron hole pair that travels through the medium, recombine, work with, uh, recombine through an interaction with the environment, create a further electron hole pa pair that travels through. So, so yes, in, thi in this sense, really, uh, one direction is a propagation of, a, of an electron. The other direction, an uh, arrow drawn in the other direction, is the propagation of a hole. So, yes, in that sense, it is um, there is a, a time in there, time and, and and place, and all kinds of integrations, right? So, you, yes, if you want to distill formulas out of it. So, uh, so what is the nice thing about this random phase approximation is that we can express the sum. And not only of the polarization bubbles, so I include now explicitly uh, uh, exchange as well, so exchange in the sense of Fock exchange, that we can, this whole class, this whole sum, we can express as a, a screen Coulomb interaction. So, and this screen Coulomb interaction is now this doubly wiggled line. So uh, we have this line, which is our propagator of, of our particle under consideration, 
And all of these guys, eh, so this wiggly line and this wiggly line plus the bubble and the other wiggly line and this one and this part, we sum up and sort of put into this doubly wiggly line where we say this is our, um, our screened Coulomb interaction. And if we write that out in terms of a formula, this would be <coughs> a bare Coulomb interaction. This would be a bare Coulomb interaction times an independent particle propagating propagation, uh, sorry, an inter independent particle polarizability times a Coulomb interaction. And this one is V times chi naught times V times chi naught times V. And this is what we saw yesterday, right? So this is this, <coughs> this thing that we can express as a geometrical series and that, in fact, uh, adds up to being our, um, our, our dielectric uh, screening, right? So in the end, this is truly uh, a screened um, Coulomb interaction. So that's how we end up from a description of our, of our, um, of our, uh, from a perturbative description of our self energy, we end up with, well, W, this screened Coulomb interaction times a propagator G. Eh? And that is why, why this method is called GW, because we have now uh, cast our self uh, energy, the, the, the thing that we need for our quasi particle equations in terms of a, of a propagator in terms of a Green's function uh, and, a <coughs> and a product with, uh, with a screened Coulomb interaction. Right. So that we have seen, so what goes in that we have seen yesterday, right, this is our independent particle polarizability, which is in essence the change in the induced charge density due to a change in the, uh, sorry, uh, a change in the charge density due to a change in the effective potential in our cone sham system. And we can, as we saw yesterday, well, this formula looks a bit different, but we saw a, a, a very similar formula yesterday. This is just written in another way. Uh, and we can compute this in terms of our, um, of our uh, Bloch orbitals, of our cone sham orbitals, and our cone sham eigenenergies. Uh, in this particular form, um, it scales with n to the power 4, as I told you yesterday. So this is a, a very uh, computationally intensive uh, step uh, where we have a double sum. We have a double sum over orbitals. One is, one is a sum over the occupied orbitals, and we have these empty states coming in, as I told you yesterday. But the nice thing is, and that, uh, that I'll show you later on, that we can actually write this independent particle polarizability in terms of Green's functions as well, and end up with an al algorithm that scales cubically. So in essence, scales uh, as badly or, or as well as our DFT, with a very different prefactor though, but yes. So this is in its canonical form, it scales as n to the power 4. But if we cast it in Green's functions, um, it, we end up with a, with a better scaling algorithm. That's a point that, that we'll come to later. So we've <coughs> seen this is essentially what I, what I showed you yesterday, right? So that we can uh, write this sum as the product of, uh, of our Coulomb uh, operator and a geometrical series uh, that represents the inverse of our dielectric matrix. Yes. So. Yeah, then in essence, we are set to, uh, to do uh, GW. We have uh, an expression for, for our um, self energy, the product of a Green's function and uh, a screen Coulomb, Coulomb interaction. Well, it's written a bit more explicitly here. And so what is a screen Coulomb interaction? It's essentially this thing where we have dielectric screening and one over R minus R prime in essence. And this is this Green's function that I already showed you um, uh, yesterday. So compared to Fock exchange, actually you, you see that this is a, um, in essence a screened exchange interaction uh, in GW. Right? If you if you make the comparison here, we have two orbitals uh, n uh, at r and r prime, and this is very very much like uh, the the Fock potential. Only now the Coulomb operator in in this uh, in this potential has been screened with the dielectric properties of our material. And that is a connection that you could make, for instance, to hybrid functional theory, right? Because in hybrid functional theory, we say we use a quarter of this. Yeah? So this would be like using a fixed screening. So I'm saying we screen this at every 
uh, point r and r prime and every frequency with the same uh, amount, with one quarter. Uh, and here we are, of course, we have an object that is material dependent, right? Because we compute this for every system. So it's not a fixed screening, but uh, yeah, this is, tries to take in account the true dielectric properties of our system within an approximation. Right, so that's a, a recap of, um, of what we have seen before. So are, are there questions at this point? Yes? So in random phase, what is that phase referring to? That is a very good question, and I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, no, I, I really don't know. It, it, it's used everywhere, and I think there's even a lot of papers where they say we don't know where it comes <coughs> from. <laughs> and I don't know either. I have the feeling uh, it comes out of um, high energy physics, an approximation that was used in high energy physics, but I, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't say where. And I, I, it's, it's, it's a feeling I have that it comes out of high energy physics probably something that somebody some at some point mentioned to me, but I, no, I, I really don't know why it's called random phase approximation. Yeah? Essentially, when you create those uh, <coughs> electron four pairs, you consider only a single excitation, right? So what would be the next level of excitation? Well, the next level, the next level, what you would do here, uh, actually, to go beyond the random phase approximation, we'll discuss this uh, uh, later, is to include uh, exchange-like processes. Because by far worse uh, than the thing that you mentioned is the fact that this, <coughs> that this is not uh, properly anti-symmetric. Uh, yes, so you would have to, in, in, uh, so, but I'll come, I'll come to this later. But this, uh, for instance, in, in the exchange, as far as the exchange is concerned, then there's only the naked exchange, this Fock exchange. So second order processes in exchange are immediately uh, neglected already. So that's one thing that, 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 is, um, that has serious consequences. Um, and these guys, and there's a whole bunch of them that have little more wiggly lines here. They're called ladder diagrams. They're also uh, neglected and they represent excitonic effects. So that, that is one of the things that people commonly do to go beyond this kind of approximations, is include excitonic effects, and then you end up with something like beta sub beta equations. So, yes, yeah, so if you create an electron and a hole, they don't feel each other's presence, right, in, in this case. As they travel, they should actually feel the fact that, that there's another guy with the opposite sign present. So that's all, all neglected. Yes. So, uh, so do you actually add the explicit naked exchange term, or does it just get, get added because of the? No, that's added. That's added explicitly. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Can, can uh, when you're asking a question, can you stand up so the ceiling mics can hear? The, um, There's the mics in the remote. ceiling. Yes. Ah, oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <coughs> yeah. So, can we use a similar idea to HAC to only apply to short range to reduce the cost? Uh, That's what's done. Well, yeah, the screening is, is in there, right? So, so, okay, so, yeah, but you wouldn't want to tinker with it because, I mean, and so the, the interaction is screened. But you wouldn't want to want to violate this anymore. Uh, then you already have because you compute it in a certain approximation. But but yeah. So the interaction is screened, but with the true dielectric properties of the of the uh, well, not the true dielectric properties, but the property, the random phase approximation to the dielectric properties of the material. Yeah. So now you wouldn't want to uh, to play with that um, per se. So. So uh, yeah, this is this an analogy that I <coughs> have alluded to uh, already before. So there we do actually see uh, the screening as a function. Well, this is the trace of this <coughs> of this matrix with respect to uh, with respect to um, um, reciprocal space vectors. And what we do see here, so it's for two materials. For so for a, for a very small gap material like gallium arsenide and for a material with a slightly larger gap, 
or with an appreciable gap like magnesium oxide. And you do see, uh, so for, especially for gallium arsenide, which is, belongs to this group of materials that is fairly well described by uh, hybrid functionals, we see that the screening in this area, this, so this red line, um, and this is an important area uh, in, in terms of reciprocal space uh, of, of the dielectric screening, uh, we see that this fairly well matches with, with what the hybrid does for you. So this is an HSE hybrid. Uh, so it's not exactly one quarter, right? Because we have, this, we have this error function, which of course means that if we Fourier transform this, it's not simply one quarter, but we have a, a, a little variation. We see that this quite nicely matches. But if we go to, uh, to uh, materials with larger gaps, like MGO, we see that the dielectric properties, if we would compute them in the random phase approximation, uh, the onset of this screening here is quite a bit different from, from this one quarter that, that, that we are effectively using. Right. Yes. Uh, having problem uh, understanding the x-axis, so g is the increase function? Or no, no, g sorry, g is a reciprocal space oh. vector. Yeah, yes. Right, so as we go to larger reciprocal space vectors, we're dealing with faster fluctuations yeah, in, in the response. Right, so, so we see that, that this one quarter is actually a fair compromise for, for systems that, uh, that have uh, small, uh, small gaps. So this is the reason why this, why this, uh, fairly, why this works so well, uh, these hybrid functionals. So this one quarter doesn't exactly fall from the sky in that sense, right? It has some basis. Okay, so let me see, how am I doing? Okay, um, yes. So I'll skip this because, well, this is a nice uh, thing. This is a, an, an implementational point, uh, uh, how we compute the, we compute the chi naught uh, in its, uh, using its spectral uh, representation. This is uh, computationally advantageous to do. Um, and then you compute the imaginary part. Um, sorry, you compute uh, the spectral function and then you, from this you get the imaginary part and from a Kramers chronic transformation, or in this case a Hilbert transformation, you, you get uh, the real part of the, of the function as well. Um, anyway, this is just, uh, I won't want to put too much emphasis on this because actually we have a, a better algorithm now uh, to do this and that will be uh, released pretty soon. Okay, let's go to, uh, to actually <coughs> doing uh, GW. Because we already said that this cell, or I already said that this self energy depends on uh, on this particular energy, right? On this on this quasi particle energy. So there's uh, this, there's a possibility to uh, to do an additional level of, of self consistency here. These quasi particle energies are given by this particular expectation value, and now we could solve this by iteration, obviously, right? So we solve this for a certain for uh, starting with starting with the, um, the eigenenergies of our cone sham system, solve the quasi-particle equation, get quasi-particle energies, put them in, solve it again, get new quasi-particle energies, put them in and solve them again, and so on, and so on, and so on. Right? Um, so that is, that is written here. And actually what we do, we linearize this equation uh, around the quasi-particle energy, around the cur current quasi-particle energy, and solve uh, an equation like this. Um, yeah. And if you, if you do not do any um, self-consistency with respect to these, to these energies, to these quasi-particle energies, uh, you are doing what uh, we call single-shot GW, G naught, W naught. So in essence, you calculate the DFT orbitals, get these cone sham orbitals and their eigenenergies simply plug them in, uh, so compute the Green's functions belonging to this, compute the screening properties belonging uh, from these uh, orbitals and eigenenergies, and compute your screen Coulomb uh, interaction and your um, um, self-energy, and solve these equations one time, uh, where here the self-energy depends on the eigenenergies, on our cone sham eigenenergies. So that is a single shot GW. Yeah, and where we have linearized this equation, so we, we take variations uh, of the self-energy uh, um, around 
our uh, Cartland uh, cone sham eigenenergies into account uh, in a linear fashion. That is what is, what is mentioned here. Um, so that is single shot uh, GW. Um, one step beyond this would be wh what is called GW naught, uh, because these eigenenergies that we put into our self energy, they go into the Green's function, right? Under the, uh, into the, let's, do I have this here? Yes, yeah, so into the Green's function at this point, that is where they go. But of course, they also go into this Adler, Adler and Weiser formula for the screening, right? So we can, uh, we can distinguish between uh, updating um, our Green's functions in terms of the eigenenergies. Huh? Do we want to transfer these quasi-particles that we get from single shot GW? Do we want to put them into our new Green's function? Or do we also want to put them into our description of the screening, right? So, and the most commonly used approximation beyond uh, single shot GW is actually GW naught, where we do not update the, um, the eigenenergies with which we have computed um, the screening properties, we only update them um, in our Green's function, <coughs> right? And the orbitals remain the same. Uh, they're, they're still cone-sham orbitals. Um, and the quasi-particles that we get from single-shot GW are now used to compute a new Green's function. And that is what we call uh, GW naught. And that you can repeat a few, uh, few times. Uh, so you can, uh, can, can loop over this a few times, so three, four times, and then mostly uh, the quasi-particles you get out of these GW0 uh, calculations have uh, converged. And why do I mention this, um, this so explicitly? Because this is actually, within the random phase approximation, this is almost the only uh, um, thing that you could do on top of G0, W0 that makes any sense. All the other things, and I'll show you some examples, all the other things might be uh, helpful in some cases, but in most cases won't work very well. And that is because actually, and I'll, I'll show you the examples of this, that it's actually because there is a there's, uh, um, cancellation of errors uh, involved in, in uh, using the random phase approximation and using eigenenergies and eigenstates from DFT. So you do get Actually, you do get a very nice uh, description of your dielectric screening in the random phase approximation as long as you use eigenenergies and eigenfunctions from DFT. If you start to update this, th your description of screening properties will not improve <coughs> in, in most cases. So there's limits, right? Because you know, the, we do not have the true dielectric screening. We have an approximation to this. And, and that approximation actually works quite well as long as you stick to uh, to density functional, uh, uh, let's say, PBE, eigenenergies, and eigenfunctions. Yes? Excuse me, so in this case, you don't update the sign, right? The G. I don't oh. have what? In, in the update in the G, you only update the... Only update the eigenenergies. You don't update the... No. Function. So why right. that? Well, that's, that is possible, so approximately possible, but even more expensive. And uh, we'll, we'll get to this. Um, and as soon as you start updating more and more and more, what will become apparent is the limitations of your random phase approximation. So you're not going to get a better description. You're not going to get better agreement with experiment. You're going, only going to get closer to the true random phase approximation result. And that will then show in, into its entirety the limitations of your random phase approximation. So this is from a practical <coughs> point of view, single shot GW and GW not, where as you say, you, you actually only update the quasi-particle energies, eh, not the orbitals. Those are the things that within the random phase approximation make sense. If not, you will have to, so if you want to go beyond this, you will have also to go beyond the random phase approximation in your description of dielectric screening, which will be costly, much more costly than, yeah, right. So, okay, well, this is uh, a, f a little flowchart. Um, yes? Uh, is it possible to uh, say typically uh, comparing DFT with 
true answer where G W and where G W naught and where G G naught W naught. I, I will show a, a little oh. graph uh, that shows you. Uh, in terms of band gap, I, I will show you some comparison to of of. <coughs> and in terms of I'm, uh, I, uh, like uh, excited states, and then, well, yeah. I yeah, guess that, that, that yes, in the sense, that, well, GW is, is ex yeah. yes, that would be truly exciting. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, okay. So DFT ground state, uh, yes. So what we do, uh, well, we saw a few of these things uh, before, um, where you know, we'll discuss this yesterday. Um, when speaking about the uh, dielectric properties, uh, yeah, we start with the ground state calculation. Uh, we do uh, an one exact diagonalization of the Hamiltonian afterwards using the, the ground state's wa wave functions to get high quality, um, high quality uh, virtual states, unoccupied orbitals, and then we run our GW calculation. Either G0, W0, or GW0. Uh, depending on uh, what you'd like to do. Okay, so, yes, yeah, so what does this yield, right? So uh, we, here we have, uh, unfortunately, I really should update this graph to include uh, the hybrid functions as well, but here we have DFT, uh, the blue dots, as we saw before, strongly underestimating uh, band gaps for all materials. Then we have G naught W naught using these PBE states. Uh, those are the, the white uh, triangles. So moves nicely in the right direction, but we see still uh, still uh, um, substantial uh, deviations uh, with respect to experiment. And then uh, G W naught only updating uh, the eigen energies inside of the Green's function moves us. Uh, quite a bit closer to experiment. Uh, we see here that there are still cases that are problematic. Uh, I think this is, well, zinc oxide should always be sort of the devil. Uh, anyway, it must be in here somehow, uh, somewhere. But we see that we, that, that we do <coughs> uniformly well. Uh, so so in for the hybrid functionals going through these larger gap systems, uh, deviations were, were uh, quite substantial. And here we do, well, sort of uniformly well. And we see that actually updating, <coughs> updating the eigenenergies in the Green's functions uh, makes a lot of sense here. So updating the orbitals. So there is the possibility to update the orbitals. And uh, this is the self-consistent quasi-particle uh, GW. Um, <coughs> and there's, uh, well, this is a description of how this is done. This is approximately done. Um, I won't go into, into the technicalities of this, only mention that it is possible to do it. And uh, there's a little flowchart how to do it. So it's a, a, essentially the same thing that we've done before, but now there's a, a, a slightly different keyword here uh, that specifies the algorithm that, to use there. It's much more expensive than, uh, than the calculations we saw before. And actually, there in most cases, there's really a very either very little uh, improvement over uh, a GW uh, naught, huh? um, or there's a slight worsening um, <coughs> of the of the um, of the comparison with with respect to experiment. So, and this is still, as you see, this is still using the screening from uh, DFT. So we have still not updated anything. In, uh, in, in the dielectric properties of our system. That is still, remains still firmly at the level of DFT, right? So what do we do here? We update now the Green's function in its entirety, right? So not only the eigenenergies, but also the orbitals. And we see that in most cases, there's actually quite, uh, quite little difference with respect to, uh, to GW0, as we saw before. Yes? Uh, in some sense, the quality of your uh, GW0 performance, like in terms of how well it agrees with theoretical bandwidth, yeah. experimental bandwidth, yes. uh, depends on your input quasi-particle energies and wave function space, or logical. Yes. Which come from regular DFT. <coughs> yes. So if, is, is it, I mean, have you ever observed that if you go to a higher level of 
theory, let's say, you know, hybrid functionals in uh, in using those, uh, how should I say, those uh, energies and uh, orbitals as, uh, as input, does GW perform considerably better compared to just regular GFD? No. No. No, that is, and, and that, that goes back to, uh, to exactly the same point made before, that this combination of random phase approximation and DFT input uh, matches well. Uh, only when, you're, when, you're, uh, when your system at the DFT level is really, really horribly described, it pays off to do something like uh, an HSE, a hybrid functional calculation, and G not W not. So don't update anything there. Then you can do a single shot uh, the GW calculation on top of it. So for instance, if you have something that in DFT is a metal and definitely should not be, then it might pay off to start from, uh, from a hybrid functional. But you wouldn't want to do anything beyond single shot GW on top of that. Yeah. Yes. OK, so there are cases where um, <coughs> we're updating, um, updating the orbitals in the uh, Green's function pays off, or is even necessary. Um, so there's two examples here. On the left, uh, we see um, a barium titanate. And that is uh, uh, GW0 uh, versus self-consistent quasi-particle GW0. Um, we see there's hardly any difference between, let's, well, mainly looking at the onset of the blue and the red lines, we see there's hardly any difference. But if we go to lanthanum aluminate, um, we see that, uh, that including uh, updating the orbitals in the Green's function actually makes uh, an appreciable difference. So there's no real way, actually, to say beforehand uh, whether, that should, whether that is the case, where, whether updating the quasi-particles in the Green's function uh, will, will uh, change a lot. Uh, but the cases where it is, in fact, so are very seldom. Yeah? So this is, this is an example of it, but there's not so many uh, as far as I know. OK. So uh, this goes then to fully self-consistent GWs. And then, uh, well, the thing that I have been telling you uh, doesn't really pay off to do. Uh, and this is just to illustrate that. And fully self-consistent GW means that now we do everything, right? We update orbitals and eigenenergies everywhere, not only in the Green's function, but also in our description of the dielectric uh, screening. And see and behold, uh, not only is it a much more computationally intensive um, uh, operation to do this, uh, but we see that now we firmly move away from experiment and we start overestimating uh, the gaps appreciably. And that is because now what we see, in fact, here is that um, uh, if we use RPA orbitals and RPA um, eigenenergies, our description of the dielectric screening is not good. So it is good within the random phase approximation. So the random phase approximation in conjunction with DFT orbitals and eigenenergies uh, works nicely. But if you go to full self-consistency, uh, you see the limitations of this random phase approximation. Right, so what is, what is one of the things what is missing? So one of the, one of the most important things that is, that is what is missing is excitonic effects. Uh, I showed you these, these what, what is commonly called ladder diagrams. So there's ways to include it at this level. So to go beyond the random phase approximation uh, to a more, um, uh, a more fancy description of the dielectric screening. And then, actually, at full self-consistency, you move back towards experiment. Uh, so this is the random phase approximation where we, uh, when we create electron and hole pairs, uh, when, we, when these bubbles arise, they do not interact, these electron and hole pairs, as they themselves travel through the system. Um, uh, so there, in that sense, there's no electron hole interaction, uh, as it's labeled here. There's no excitonic effects. We can include them, uh, well, this is by means of the nanoquantum kernel, uh, this work by Lucia Reining, uh, we can include them um, in the screening, and then we move back from these white uh, triangles back to uh, experiment. But this, unfortunately, scales like something uh, like n to the power 5, n to the power 6. So it is possible, but uh, it's not really tractable, right? 
So it doesn't pay off to go uh, to do anything uh, self-consistent within the description of your dielectric properties. Not if you want to remain within the random phase approximation. So that point is made here in terms of, uh, of dielectric uh, constants. I enclaimed dielectric constants. Uh, you could have a look at it, but it nicely illustrates uh, this point. Yeah. So that comes to what do we ex actually neglect in the random phase approximation, right? So second order exchange uh, like things uh, and beyond, obviously, and these uh, ladder diagrams of which there are infinitely many uh, themselves that uh, in essence capture excitonic effects. So second order exchange-like interactions um, there's no simple physical uh, interpretation of these processes, but uh, eh, normally you'd say that if, you, um, if, you, if you're not um, anti-symmetric in, in, uh, in all your, your uh, interactions, uh, you have a, a certain level of self-interaction eh, in, in our, in our, um, in our um, self-energy. So in the RPA description of our self-energy, the electron interacts with itself, which should <coughs> not be, obviously. And, uh, and these particle hole, ladder, particle hole diagrams or ladder diagrams, they capture electrostatic interaction between these electrons and holes that, that are created, and those are these excitonic effects. And another buzzword that you will often hear, hear of is they are the so-called vertex corrections in, in W. Well, what they do is they remove self-screening. So, uh, so there's, there's an energetic contribution in the self-interaction, and our electron that travels to the system in RPA also screens itself, which is not correct, obviously. So those are the things that are, uh, that are neglected in the RPA, and that works well in connection with density functional theory, uh, cone sham orbitals, and eigenenergies, but not so well if we go beyond. So the best approaches that you could do now is G naught W naught or G W naught, possibly self-consistent quasi-particle G W naught on top of um, density functional theory, orbitals and uh, eigenenergies. Or if PBE uh, or density functional theory is completely unreasonable for your system, you might do G naught W naught on top of a hybrid functional. And those are the two things that, that, uh, that make sense to do uh, within the random phase approximation. So we spoke about this yesterday, uh, the potentials that one should use in connection with these, uh, with these uh, calculations are the so-called, uh, are these GW potentials, so the underscore GW uh, podcar files, because they uh, are constructed in such a manner that we represent scattering properties uh, up to uh, energies high up in, into the uh, excited state of the, of the uh, atomic system. And, and that is necessary to get high quality virtual states that we need uh, for <coughs> these methods that sum over virtual states. So, um, yeah. are there questions? A moment. The dotted lines. Yeah. Okay, the drawn lines are the scattering properties, uh, and, and the measure of the sca <coughs> scattering properties is this logarithmic derivative. Um, and those are plotted here. The dotted lines are for the for the pseudo atom, and uh, the drawn lines are for the for the for the all electron problem. So if they match, we have constructed a pseudo potential that truly represents the scattering properties of the all-electron problem. Uh, and they do match here, close to, uh, yeah, within the valence regime, they, they match nicely. If you go higher up in the spectrum, they do not match anymore. And our pseudo potential doesn't describe the scattering properties of our atom uh, very well anymore. And that so is done is better here. here. Okay. Yeah. So, so why yeah. not always use the underlying you could, in fact, always use them. Um, but 
they're uh, slightly more expensive because the, um, so uh, we talked about this POW uh, formalism where we have these, these local functions. These need more local functions. So the cost is actually, it's not, not so much higher. So the cost of doing a ground state calculation with these and these uh, will yield well, very, very similar results and, and it will be approximately uh, as costly. And uh, slightly more costly here. Some of them might be a, a bit harder. That could be. Huh? It could be that in, uh, that, that, but that would definitely not be the case per se, but it could be that for some examples uh, to, get, uh, to get them to match up to higher um, energies, the, the core had to be decreased or something. And creating these potentials is sort of playing with, uh, with many, many parameters un until you end up with something <coughs> that, is, uh, that, that looks nice in this sense and still uh, reason is re reasonable in terms of the number of plane waves that you would need to use to represent the valence electrons. So it might be that cutoff energies are slightly different. Yeah, so in that sense, one of them might be more expensive than the other one. But it should be very, very similar. So if you use a project where you, uh, so normally you would say you wouldn't switch potentials inside one project, right? So if you're planning to do GW and you're planning to use these, you would probably use the, sa the same potentials for your other calculations with which you want to compare. Uh, so that total, so that the energies are directly comparable, yeah. So your benchmarks were all fairly simple closed shell semiconductors. Can you comment on how GW does with more complex materials like transition metal oxides? Um, well, transition metal oxides, it, it's mentioned uh, actually here and, it, and it's, uh, it's one, of these, one of these things that so strongly localized states are still a problem for, for a GW as well. Uh, so there, there definitely is a very big problem in DFT as we know. So D, uh, 3D states or 4F states, they are, they are, we know that they are not where they should be in, uh, in, in DFT. Um, but that is definitely still a problem within GW as well. Yeah. Well, this is also related to RPA. There are also problems with atomization energies, correct? Yes. Yeah. We'll we'll come to uh, to uh, to this. Yeah. Yeah. Because that is that is actually the next uh, topic on the on the agenda, and that is RPA total energies. Yeah. Um, so I, I yes. I have one more question. Yes. So, um, from the figure you have shown, it seems like GW or whatever you do with G GW, it's always move the you know, band gaps up. I mean... Compared to DFT, yes, and yeah. it should. So in the case, like, uh, you know, when DFT does really well in, in predict predicting the band, band gap already, if you apply GW on top of it, yeah. what's going to happen? It just to stay on, I mean, good value, or it just... Uh, Keep going up. Actually, there is no such thing as uh, as a case where where I think there's no such thing as a case where where DFT does very well in predicting the band gap. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it is yes, it's systematically underestimated. So it always helps. Then. Yes. If you were to compare HEC band gaps to GW band gaps, how do they correct? Is it true that HEC band gaps are usually larger? Um, no, no. So there. Um, um, actually, that that is um, that is why I said I should put that on on the slide. Um, so HSE does well in this area, um, as be and compared to uh, to for instance G not W not HSE would do better in in this area, and here it would uh, quite strongly underestimate the band caps. So uh, in that sense, HSE band caps are definitely not always larger or always smaller than uh, GW band caps. Um, but here, definitely, if you if you wouldn't go to uh, to GW not, if you would stick to G not W not, you wouldn't good uh, good uh, get as good band caps in in that area as you would get with a hybrid function. Yes. Oh, what in terms of the cold band structure? If you look at some D bands below the Fermi level. Yes. So that that is very hard to uh, to to say. I mean, they're too high up. I would I would still say in in. In both. Yes. 
Yes. And we have no, no, no real uh, which one is better, HNC versus genomic. I, I wouldn't want to venture. Um, yes. I, I'm, I'm sure there's people that can answer this question, but I, I, I can't, unfortunately. Is there? So we have a couple of questions online. One I think was very similar, which areas does HSC outperform GW? Um, well, in the sense that, as, as I, well, in, in terms of G0W0, uh, for, this, for small gap systems, uh, hybrid functions often do better. If you then compare to GW0, uh, which, which is a slight, uh, slightly more expensive calculation, uh, I would say they're on par. Yes. Um. Can you use a combination of GW with? I, I suspect the answer to the question is referring to running a, a VASP run using both and GW and At the same time, I, I'm. Uh, DFT <laughs> and GW, to clarify. Um, <coughs> well, yes, you can do both. Well, you have to do a DFT calculation before you do a GW calculation. So, so you would have. I mean, maybe I, I, I misunderstand the uh, question. Uh, but. Uh, a little more clarification is coming through. Okay. Such as for VO2, V use GW and O use DFT. No. Okay. No, inside the same. Co no, no, there's no way to distinguish. Uh, no. No, no, no. No. So, so use, use one functional on part of the system and another functional on another part of the, that's not possible, no, no, no. Okay, okay, so, so what we have seen uh, uh, before, right, we have, uh, we have looked at um, electronic structure, so we have looked at these one, uh, one electron energies and quasi-particle energies, things like this, and in connect, well, all of these, all of these equations that we that we have seen, uh, so cone sham equations, Rotan equations, quasi-particle equations. So, for the cone sham uh, equations and the Rotan equations, uh, they're the, they're the variation of, of a total energy expression with respect to these one-electron orbitals, right? So now we could ask ourselves: Are these quasi-particle equations related to some total energy expression? in the same sense, and, and actually they are. So there is something uh, like an RPA total energy. Uh, before we have seen RPA band structure, uh, which was our GW, and, our, and these RPA total energies, they are computed in what is, what is called ACFTT, um, or you can derive them in, in what is called ACFTT, the adiabatic connection fluctuation dissipation theorem, I won't go through, through any of these, of these uh, theorems or the proof. I'll just give you the result. And the resulting expression, well, it's, it's a kinetic energy. Huh? This RPA total energy is a kinetic energy that we simply compute from our orbitals, as we have seen before. A hard free energy, depending on the density, completely common. Then we have an, a Fock uh, um, exchange energy uh, computed with the um, uh, density <coughs> functional theory orbitals. Uh, so in that sense, it's different from a hybrid functional, uh, where you have hybrid functional orbitals. But this is uh, Fock energy evaluated with uh, DFT orbitals. And uh, well, OK, interaction with, with the ions, obviously. And the correlation energy that for which we now have an RPA expression. And what we see here, again, is that this depends on, on the quantities that, that we have uh, seen before in GW as well, on this independent <coughs> particle polarizability that we can compute from our DFT orbitals and, and eigen energies. So evaluate, and this is, this is the correlation energy within the random phase approximation, right? And uh, yeah, okay, naively evaluating this or in a, in a canonical form, uh, using this Adler visa formula, this scales as, um, as n to the power 4, not because evaluating this particular expression scales like that, but because computing the independent particle polarizability <coughs> has, this, uh, has this unfortunate scaling behavior with respect to system size. So in terms of diagrams, 
Um, we, well, this is sort of uh, trying to, uh, to show you uh, what, what this kind of expression, why this kind of expression is related uh, to what we have seen um, in GW before. Right, so this is our, this is actually, um, let, let's, this is actually, if you would, um, sorry, if you would think, remove this particular line, uh, sorry, this one, uh, this one that, that goes up, if you would remove that propagator and think of, of, of that one as a straight line here, as we saw before, then, then what you see there is actually GW. This, that is, again, then, one of these propagators times a screened uh, a Coulomb interaction. If we look at what this logarithm does, uh, so we expand this, this logarithm, it's a Taylor expansion of it, then it's a sum of this one, of this one, and of this one, and those are related to, uh, to our GW equations in the following sense. So our total energy we can, uh, we can derive as the derivative so GW is the <coughs> derivative of our RPA correlation energy with respect to the Green's function. Taking the derivative with respect to a Green's function in one of these bubbles means removing one of these lines. Uh, and if you then play this through, uh, so if you take this, this expression in, in diagrams that we saw before uh, for these RPA total energies, and you remove one line everywhere in these diagrams, you end up with exactly the same thing that we saw before. So there is this connection between the total energy in the random phase approximation and electronic structure in the random phase approximation. Right, so in the same or in a similar sense as there is a connection between, um, uh, between um, electronic structure from your cone sham equations and your and your density functional theory total energy, right? So, okay, so how well does this work? It works quite well. These are all slides that, uh, that try to make this point, that compare uh, random phase, uh, so <coughs> computations for lattice constants in the random phase approximation with uh, other methods, PBE, MP2, hartree fock things like this. I don't want to go into, uh, into all these details. You can uh, have a look at this um, as you please. Um, one of the things that I would like to mention, and that is, that is uh, quite important, uh, that in this, RPA, um, in this RPA expression for the total energies, uh, we see here, for instance, the comparison between uh, an energy versus volume co curve for graphite and diamond. And we see that, we, we, that for instance, in, this, in, the, in the random phase approximation, we get the equilibrium volume and structure for graphite correct, which is, which is quite an accomplishment because there's Van der Waals interactions going on there. So that's already an indication <coughs> that within this a total energy expression, um, we get a measure of Van der Waals interactions. And not only do we get that correct, but also uh, these atomization energies for, um, um, for diamond and graphite, they're they're roughly uh, degenerate, and that is something that, that one finds in, in experiment as well. Um, yes. So if we then go to, OK, that is sort of making this point again. Ah, yeah. Another thing is that the behavior of the total energy uh, with respect to the interlayer distance in graphite has the right uh, character. So it should, it should behave as one over the, the interlayer distance to the power four that we do get out of our, our random phase um, approximation calculations for the total energy. Well, going one uh, step beyond this, you could look at noble gas solids. So they're, they're actually only bound by van der Waals interactions or primarily bound by van der Waals interactions and compute uh, C6 coefficients uh, for these uh, compounds. And we do see that we get um, really quite nice <coughs> results uh, compared to experiments. So now we have finally a functional that captures Van der Waals interactions as well. Um, well, does quite well for heat of formation. Uh, the bad news is that, that lo looking at this, uh, that if, if one looks closely to the numbers, one sees that well, we, we, see we have quite nice heat of formation. 
but chemical accuracy is not reached for this particular functional. Right? So, so we do quite well for, for many aspects, but it's still, it's definitely not the end of the line. Yeah? I've put this on the slide. We would like to be able to compute total energy differences uh, with uh, deviations with respect to experiment no larger than, than one kcal per mole, and that is uh, something that is definitely not uh, reached uh, by computing total energies within the random phase approximation. Um, the other thing that, that I, I already said that I would uh, come back to this point is this CO adsorption on, uh, on D-metallic surfaces. And uh, so this was the, one of those things that were hard to get uh, right, that we didn't get uh, right in, in DFT, that we didn't get right in um, uh, using hybrid functionals. And uh, so one of the, one, another way of looking at, at, at these problems uh, is depicted in this graph. So what we see here is adsorption energy of CO on these surfaces, on, on 111 <coughs> platinum and rhodium 111. Uh, and in the same graph, we have, the, we have sort of plotted it against the surface energy. And what we do see, uh, well, experiment is here, right? So, and we see that, uh, that, that for our for a whole host of functionals, and not only, uh, not only actually density functionals, but hybrid functionals as well, they move along uh, these lines. And they, they combine uh, two large absorption energies with, um, with two um, small surface energies. And that is actually a bit of a, of a strange thing if you think about it. So intuitively, you wouldn't expect this, because a too small surface energy means that the surface is actually a bit too happy to be a surface, and then it should not be so keen on binding anything. So these are the sort of two things that, that you wouldn't necessarily expect to occur at the same time. And not only this, but going from one functional to another, we see a sort of a trade-off between, uh, between those two effects. Um, and we move along these lines that doesn't get closer to, to experiment, actually. If we do this in the random phase approximation, we move away from these lines and break with this and get, for some stuff, get actually quite close to experiment. And the fact that for platinum, uh, we're still ways off uh, with respect to uh, the experiment in terms of the surface energy, uh, we partly blame the experiment for this. So, <laughs> so we would like to blame the experiment for this. It's not so easy to, uh, to, uh, to get to do good experiments on, uh, to get really reliable experimental uh, data on these surface energies. So there's, there's possibly room for improvement at the experimental side as well. Anyway, uh, going, uh, so recapping, uh, oh, connecting to what, what, what we compared to before uh, for this kind of systems, we have looked at side preference and adsorption energies, and now we see that not only do we get good structural properties, so we get re very reasonable surface energies, we get good structural description of the system, but we also get good absorption energies now, and we get the right side preference. And that is sort of collected in this graph. That is uh, a bit of a horrible graph. Um, anyway, this, this shows you that we are inside of, so this is experimental error bars. Uh, this is indicating that we are uh, this, is, this indicates where experiment says it should, uh, it should absorb. And actually, we do find the right sides, and we are within the uh, experimental error bars for the absorption energies. So which is quite nice. Um, and as we, so, so what we have is, is actually a total energy functional that, that sort of does well for the molecule, but also does, does very reason, uh, gives very reasonable results for metallic systems eh, at the same time. And now we can, can really fully describe this problem. Before we saw that we do either well for the molecule with a hybrid functional, but screw up the description of our metallic system, or vice versa, we have a good description of our metallic system in density functional theory, but not uh, of our molecular states. And this is reached here, so this is sort of unified here and works quite well. So that point is made. Uh, actually here. So what do we see in density functional theory? We see that our molecular states are uh, uh, homo-lumo gap is too small. So this is where experiment claims it should be or where it should be experimentally or well, we're ways off. And especially this 
a LUMO is much too close to the metallic states. If we go to the, to the hybrid functional, uh, we do very well actually for, for these molecular states, very close to where experiment uh, would like them to be, but the D metal bandwidth has um, become too large and especially in this area the back bonding is, uh, is still too strong. So if we go now to a GW description of this, which is this electronic uh, structure um, um, pendant to our total energy, uh, we see that especially for the LUMO we, we still do very well. For the metal there's almost no difference between density functional theory and the GW description. Homo states are not so nicely described, but for this problem, um, not of, of, the, of the main importance. And uh, so this sort of unifies a good description of our LUMO states with a good description of our um, metal surface. Right, so to do uh, GW calculations, uh, sorry, uh, RPA total energy calculations, there's a, a flow chart involved few steps, so there's an additional step compared to, uh, to GW. Um, there's a script in, in one of the, so for the hands-on section, there's a script that takes care of this uh, and, and have a look at all these scripts uh, because they simply, mostly they copy INCAR files to, uh, so INCAR files to uh, an INCAR file that pertains to a particular step is copied to INCAR and then VASP is run. So, um, and then if you look into these INCAR files, you'll see all these tags. Uh, and, and hopefully the manual will be explanative enough to, uh, to give you an inkling of what is <coughs> happening. So what do you need to test in these cases? Well, uh, the usual things. Um, well, this is something that, that we'll, well, we can probably discuss uh, better at the, um, during the hands-on sessions. So what we do have is a well-balanced total energy expression that captures all types of bonding. Uh, what we unfortunately do not have is a total energy expression that is uh, accurate enough to reach the final goal, which is this chemical accuracy. So I would like to mention this uh, huh, because I've, I've, I've alluded to it a few times and mentioned uh, the fact that the way that we compute the um, independent particle polarizability scales so horribly uh, with, with the fourth power of system size. Well, there's now, um, we have been working on, on an algorithm that scales cubically. And with, so that, that, that removes this limitation. It's work of Mersu Kaltak, Virgin Klimesh, and, uh, and Georg Kresse, uh, my boss. Um, well, this is again, this is what we have seen, our Green's yeah. function. Now it's, it's written in imaginary time. Um, and in terms of a Green's function in imaginary time, we can compute the polarizability uh, as a product of two Green's functions. Um, and this is a, a, well, a point by point product, so uh, uh, over R and R prime. So, what is the nice thing about this? A point by point product over two quantities that scale. Uh, with system size scales as the, as the square of the system size and not n to the power of 4. So getting the in independent particle polarizability this way is much, much cheaper. Um, yeah, well, you have to do some clever stuff to, uh, to uh, have a transform, a cosine transform of this guy to imaginary frequency, and then you can simply use it in this equation that now is the worst scaling step uh, because there is a diagonalization involved of a matrix and that scales cubically. So you end up with an algorithm that is not scaling uh, as n to the power of 4, but n, uh, n to the power of 3. As in fact, yes? Why do you have to diagonalize the diagonalization? Uh, to take the logarithm. Oh, uh, you can take the logarithm <coughs> of the determinant since you have to trace, so you don't have to diagonalize. Really? I mean, the trace of the logarithm is the logarithm of the term, right? Yeah, but how would you? Trace is the character of the matrix. Right. So instead of calculating, okay, you have to diagonalize. Instead of diagonalizing, you calculate the determinant of the matrix. And, and that's what, and that would scale as? Well, it's cubic. Yes. It's not diagonalized. OK, yeah, OK, but we diagonalize here. So I, I yes, OK. But would there be, would 
would that be computationally attractive? I think to so, yeah. So they maybe okay. better. Okay. Yeah, I should look into it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, should look look into this. Yes, because we use it to take the logarithm. <laughs> we diagonalize it. Um, yeah, if that scale, if that would scale better with respect to, for instance, processors or something like this. Yes. Okay. Or memory as well. Yeah. Yeah, OK. Well, in terms of memory, because that would be my next point, there this is the limiting step, that we s store these Green's functions. So actually, these matrices that we then diagonalize are not definitely not our memory problem. <coughs> but if this would scale better with respect to, uh, well, if it would parallelize better, it would be. Determinant using Cholesky decomposition. Mm -hmm. That is, from an algorithmic point of view, better than yeah. Okay, good, thanks. Yeah. Um, yes, well, anyway, um, that is the new, uh, the new algorithm. Um, one of the critical steps is, is finding clever grids to, um, to do these transformations. Um, and that has been done, this, this nice work of, of Measu Kaltak, if you're interested. Um, <coughs> so we, we do need only very few points for these transformations. And that is more or less constant, so that doesn't scale with, that doesn't change with uh, system size. And um, yes, so what can we do this way? So prefactors are much larger than in DFT, is mentioned here, but we can do uh, these calculations to systems like a few hundreds of atoms within, well, in this case, on, uh, <coughs> on 128 cores in something like 300 seconds. So that is that's really quite powerful. The thing that, that hurts us the most at the moment is, uh, is having to store the, the Green's function uh, with respect to two spatial points, or with respect to two indices. And uh, uh, so this is very memory intensive. Yes, that's the, the current limitation. OK, I think in the interest of time, uh, we'll do questions and. Uh, so we do have a question from online. Um, up to which order of interactions is included, uh, has been included in the RPA total energy expression? So in terms of these, of, these, of these polarizability bubbles, up to infinite order. Right. Yes. But only in, in that sense, right? So only those class, uh, only that class of diagrams is is um, is included, right? And and the o the only other diagram that is included is is Fock exchange using the the PBE orbitals. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Any more? So how does the GW response function compare to the tank? The GW response function. The the right. I don't know. So time time dependent Hartley Fock or time dependent DFT or yes. I mean it should be the same thing, right? Yes. I, I would say it would be the same thing. Okay. So there is one advantage in using time over GW RPA. Well, we have spo we've spoken about this. I, so I think I know why you ask, right? So if you would want to, if you would want to uh, excite your system and follow follow uh, its state explicitly in time, you you couldn't use this, obviously, right? But if you then want from this response want to get something like a, a frequency dependent response function, then you could do this. But if you would want to follow your state as it, as it, as it decays <coughs> in time uh, explicitly, that, that is. That's all the advantage. Yes, I, I, I would say so, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the relaxation 
application of uh, the, the creating vectors, creating functions, and so uh, including the uh, every approximation that would um, give better results. So, so what exactly do you mean by relaxation of the? Because uh, I mean, say you can have the sum over state approach for calculating the direct response, but there is this cover perturbed uh, approach which allows you to um, relax your orbit, your your yeah, your eigen states uh, while you're um, in a, in a self-consistent way. So. You can uh, calculate dialectic <coughs> response uh, properties, also taking into account the, the effect of the electric field on your eigen states. Okay, so you. And this should improve uh, the dialectic response uh, evaluation. Okay. In, I don't know. <coughs> um, I, I, I must admit I don't rightly know the method you, you speak of, so I, okay. so maybe you, you could give me, uh, is there something I, I could read on this, or I, yes, I, I might give you, be able to give you an answer, but I, okay. right now I couldn't answer, sorry, yeah. Yes. So what is the difference? The difference is that one was constructed explicitly to reproduce scattering properties at higher energies as well. Uh, the other one was not. So for the ground state, there shouldn't actually be uh, a huge difference. And there shouldn't really be an advantage of using one or the other uh, for ground state calculations. <coughs> So it's not that, that there's a trade-off that, that the scattering properties at high energies are now well described at the cost of, uh, of describing scattering properties in, in the area, in the energy area where, where, where you're, that is of, of, of importance for your ground state. So it should be equally well as before. I think we're in time, Senji. <laughs> <laughs>